You know, I, so my mentor is a 101 year old guy that oh. uh, taught me to love art. And I kept saying, you know, Pete, if we go around your, your house here, you have Andy Warhol's cats, oh. you have Botero's, you have, um, you know, Marguerite's, like you have, you have fantastic art. How did you know that these were really good? And he was like, I just didn't think very much about it. I either liked a piece or I didn't. And I remember reading a study where the, the, the where they um, brought people in and they said, okay, you can choose between these two pieces of art. One is an abstract piece of art mm -hmm. and one is like one of those kind of like hang in there kitty things. Right? <laughs> yeah. And so then they said, you have to choose uh, one of these and then, uh, you know, just, just go on and you can take it home. And uh, it turns out when they just let people choose, most people chose the abstract one, right? But then they brought another group of people in and they said, okay, now you've got to choose between these two, but you've got to tell us why you're choosing it. And so when people had to explain why they chose it, then they chose the kind of hang in there kitty, hang very the simplistic. Kid. There was something they could explain. They could mm -hmm. say, well, you know, I think it's very motivational and that helps me understand it. And then what they did was they let people go home and then six months later they contacted them. And the people that had chosen the abstract art, the odds that it was hanging up somewhere in their house was, it was amazing, like 80%. But the people that had chosen the art based on, oh, we had to explain it, they had almost all either put it away in a closet or given it away to a wow. friend. And so it says something about when you have to ascribe meaning to the intuition that you have going on, it in and of itself changes your decision-making yeah. behavior wow. and not necessarily for the better. Yeah, that's fascinating. Are you an art collector? No. Why? Um, I, I'll, I'll say this. We do go to like the Clayton Art Fair and this and that. We do buy art. But, you know, we haven't done anything that's a, a, you know, a collection and, you know, the, the most expensive art I've ever bought is, you know, single-digit thousands. But what I do have is a Samsung The Frame TV over my fireplace. I saw this on your blog. This yeah. is so, so tell me about this. Yeah, so uh, it, 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 it looks like a painting when it's turned off. And there's an art store, and you can pick from thousands of works of art. And there's some, some great masters in there. You know, there's a lot of Van, Van Gogh and Cezans and Sorotes and, and things like that. Um, but then there's a bunch of other things that aren't there. Like they're speaking of impression. I mean, there's no Roy Lichtenstein or, you know, uh, not impressionism, but, but more, uh, modern. There's no Lichtensteins or Rothko's or, uh, Pollock's or anything like that. But there's a, and there's just a lot that you haven't heard of, but almost every day, either me or my wife chooses a different work of art. And then it hangs and it looks just like a painting. Like people will say, don't you have a TV in here? Like, where do you watch TV? I'm like, that's a TV. And they're like, are you kidding me? So yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. So, so in some respects, I guess I am collecting art now, but they're just digital. And you know, for my $5 a month subscription to the Samsung art store. <laughs> art is one of those things that um, it's, I, I had no exposure to it as yeah. a young person, like vir virtually none. And then even when I did start to get exposed to it, I, I, I had no way of being able to say whether I thought something was good or not. But once Pete taught me, art is whatever you mm -hmm. think is beautiful. I, I often have this like a story for um, young people that are thinking about getting married. Pete and I, the very first time he ever met the woman that became my wife, we, uh, we were at his apartment in New York. And he was absolutely insistent that we walk 20 blocks up and uh, go to this art museum. But he was not going to go. He was just sending Ann and I. Oh, wow. And then right as we're about to walk out the door, he says, Vance, come in here. And he pulls me aside and he says, uh, now, when you go to the art, don't look at the art. Look at what she sees in the art and ask her what she sees. Because whatever she sees wow. are the eyes that she's going to view you with. And that's when I was like, holy cow. Whoa. So we yeah. go. And that's what I did was I was like, what do you see here? And yeah. what do you see? And I could tell that this woman was infinitely positive, like could always find a way to to like something, even if it was harsh or jarring. But that's when you start realizing art has so much more power that, than I think what I ever had had um, any concept yeah. of. And I think that it's way, way more important. The older I get, the more important art is to me. I don't need to own it, yeah. 
but it is very important to me right. to be exposed to it. Yeah, for sure. So um, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about with art is this article I read called Enter the Super Sensorium. So it's this entire article written by this, um, I don't know, he's a neuropsychologist or something, but he's basically saying your brain, um, when you go to sleep, is trying to, do th what, what dreaming is really all about is your brain trying to take all this information that you got throughout the day and the patterns that you thought you had seen um, uh, it's going to break those apart and try and match it up um, in some different way. So the way he describes this is, are you familiar with this concept called overfitting? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it, for anybody that doesn't know, it's like you show a, uh, artificial intelligence a, a picture of a dog. You want to teach it what a dog looks like. You show it a thousand pictures of a dog, but you accidentally showed it a thousand pictures of a brown dog. And so by doing this, you now, if you show it a picture of a deer, it says brown, four legs, tail, that's a dog. That's overfitting. So what this article about the super sensorium is, is he's saying when you go to sleep at night, your brain is taking all the associations that fit patterns that you already knew and it's breaking them apart and it's refitting them in new and interesting ways, which is why when you wake up in the morning, you suddenly can remember where you put your keys when you couldn't yeah. after looking for them for hours or you, there's some problem, some mental model you were working on, probably as you're writing. You get really frustrated yeah. at night. You go to sleep. You wake up the next day and you're, and you're like, ah, like, oh, it's, it. it's right yeah. there. So that's what he is saying yeah. is going on with that. And his overarching point is one of the reasons that we have lowered the – there are so many people that say I don't get dreams is that if you expose yourself to entertainment, it is not the same thing as art. Entertainment is always giving you something where you're fitting into a groove. Like you said, you know, we kind of yeah. don't know the ending, but like everything already matches. All the right. archetypes right. already match. So when you expose yourself to art – you're filling your brain with new things that need to be fit into the pattern. So you're actually forcing your brain to have a lot more electricity, yeah. so to speak, while you're dreaming. Yeah, you know what that reminds me of is, is I just read recently this amazing, I don't know, it's like 10 page long um, essay called Creation and Destruction. It was by a guy named John Boyd, and he has since passed, but he was a fighter pilot oh, in yeah. Korea. Yeah, yeah, yeah so the OODA loop. Yeah, so he created the OODA loop for, and for people that know what that is, it's it, it, it's for observe, orient, um, decide, decide, and act, yeah. right? And this 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 concept of creation and destruction is partly what gave him the OODA loop, and the OODA loop basically means that you should do what's unexpected, and you should surprise your enemy if you have one. And you should move very quickly. And there's all, I mean, I'm, it, I'm way oversimplified. When, when John Boyd would brief people at the Pentagon on this, his minimum amount of time he wanted them to set aside is six hours. Right. So, so it's very, you know, it's very in depth. But, but John Boyd, what he said in Creation and Destruction is that really creativity comes from these, both of these things, that you have to take something and you have to destroy it and break it into its component parts. And then you put it back together. And, he, it, you know, it's almost the difference between deductive reasoning and induction. So uh, uh, destruction is deductive and, and creating something is inductive, or it's the difference between, you know, analysis and synthesis. And he gives this example, and, and it, uh, I may not get all of them, but he said, if you look at, let's say, uh, somebody going up on, the, uh, on a, a mountain skiing, right? So you think of, okay, you have the... Uh, uh, you have the, the chairlift and the skis, and you think of like a, a, a kid on a bicycle, and you have the bicycle, and you have a tank, and you have all these other things. He goes, break them down in their component parts. So you're going to have like these you know, 30 or 40 different things. So you're going to have like the, the turret of the tank and the treads of the tank, and you're going to have the, the bicycle wheels and the handles and the ski lift and everything. And he goes, if you take all those, the question then is, how do you put them back together completely differently that you've created something new. And, you know, I, I, I put the, you know, when I was reading this, this essay, I put it down, I thought about it a while, and I wasn't really coming up with anything. And you read on, and he says, you can take, um, you know, parts of the bicycle and the chairlift and the tank treads, and now you have a snowmobile. And I was like, wow, yeah. So I, I think what you're saying with this, this article is he's saying, we're, we're breaking things down. We're doing this destruction or this analysis. And then our brains put things back together and maybe in different ways, right? So instead of taking a tried and true pattern, which may be a false pattern, you take different data and information and you say, let's jumble them up and put them together differently. Yeah, my dad used to do this thing that when I was younger, used to drive me absolutely insane, which was 
he would, um, he, you know, we'd have our furniture arranged in a, in a way. And you know, most people, once the furniture is put there until you get a new couch, yeah, it all there. stays there. Right. But every couple weeks, my mom would go away for something for yeah. the evening and he would be like, Vance, come in here. <clears throat> and we'd start moving furniture oh, around. And like, then every time you enter the living room, you're like, ah, oh, it's all different. But it did make the entire experience of being it's in like our being house a new room. in a new room. My wife does that all the time. I'm just like, really? Are we going to rearrange furniture again? She's like, yes, we are. I think it's a good idea. Yeah. And as you're describing this, and I've read a lot of John Boyd, I would say your description of the way he thinks about this is really on point, man. I, have, I The OODA loop has been an interesting concept because I hear people referring to it all the time. And it's a little bit like, don't you just react to what's going on around you? Yeah, Isn't yeah. that all he's saying? But it's actually much deeper. Yeah. Well, and, and he thought that most everybody didn't get it. Like we all look for shortcuts and, you know, this, this, this idea that it's linear, that you do these four things in a row, you know, he said, you know, that's, that's really not what I'm talking about. Like it's much more random and creative than you just follow these four things. And he's like, you know, and one of the keys is, and, and, and this was interesting to read because it's, it's a lot of how we've, we've set up our company is he's like, if you are the, the general or the head commander you know, the key is, is that you have all these, you know, uh, subordinates that you completely trust and they trust you and you have to give them a lot of freedom to follow the OODA loop, to, to observe, orient, decide and react on their own. Like that you can't, it's, it takes too long for you, for them to report to you, you decide and you give it to them. And then there, there's this power in all these different people having different views of what it means in their situation and that they have to bring their own talent and creativity to it. And if you think about it, that's sort of against, you know, at least my impression of how the military is usually structured, right? With this very strict chain of command. And he turned it on its head and said, no, you've got to trust. And at each level, you've got to trust those around you and those below you in, in, in sort of the, the organization. Thanks for checking out this podcast short. If you like this interview, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button and hit that bell so you always get notified about this podcast. And if you're really interested in conversations like this, you may want to consider joining the Articulate Ventures Network. To find out more, go to network.articulate.ventures. <laughs>